welcome you all to this uh, this event. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Zia Qureshi. I'm a visiting fellow uh, in the uh, Global Economy and Development Program here at Brookings. Is the it's on. You just need to move closer. Just right. Yeah. yeah just bring it a bit closer. Yeah. Uh, so Zia Qureshi, a visiting fellow uh, in the Global Economy uh, and Development Program here at Brookings. Uh, so uh, uh, it's great to uh, to have you here, and uh, and great to see a, a full house. Uh, we have a very uh, interesting and uh, topical agenda for our discussion today: um, productivity growth, which. Uh, which is the main driver of uh, economic growth and rise in incomes in the medium to long term, uh, has slowed uh, over the uh, past uh, couple of decades. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is much debate and uh, 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 ongoing research uh, about whether we are measuring uh, productivity correctly, uh, especially in the new digital economy, uh, issues such as uh, accounting for um, uh, uh, new uh, services, uh, products and services of the digital economy, such as uh, uh, Google searches. Uh, so that debate and research uh, uh, continue. Uh, but overall, research suggests that uh, uh, the slowdown in productivity growth, uh, for the most part, is real, uh, not illusory or uh, an artifact of uh, mismeasurement. Another important trend over the uh, same period has been that uh, wages have been uh, decoupling uh, from productivity, uh, growing uh, even more slowly than uh, productivity growth, particularly at uh, low to middle wage levels. Uh, causing uh, labor's uh, share in income to fall and uh, wage inequalities uh, to, to, to rise. Uh, the result of these trends uh, has been that uh, incomes have been rising more slowly and more unequally. And these outcomes uh, are part of the uh, dynamics uh, behind the uh, 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 the uh, today's uh, uh, rising uh, societal discontent and uh, political uh, populism and, and fears about the future of growth arising from the new technologies, fears uh, uh, about what some call the, uh, uh, the coming uh, robocalypse uh, only add uh, to uh, societal uh, anxieties. Uh, to varying degrees, uh, the trends of slowing productivity, median wage stagnation, and rising income inequality are reflected in uh, many uh, or most major economies. Recent U.S. experience uh, illustrates uh, these trends particularly vividly. In the past decade, uh, labor, average labor productivity uh, in the U.S., was lower than half of what it was in the uh, previous decade. Uh, as uh, productivity slowed, wage growth uh, slowed uh, even more. With the uh, real median wage growth uh, amounting to only about a quarter of labor productivity growth over the past two decades. And over roughly the same period, Income inequality uh, in the U.S., uh, for instance, as measured by the, uh, the share of the richest 1% uh, in income, uh, more than doubled. So these uh, trends lead to uh, important questions. Why has uh, productivity, productivity growth slowed despite a boom? in new technologies. Why do we see uh, this paradox? Uh, amid the, uh, the current buzz about uh, digital uh, transformation and uh, the fourth industrial revolution, one would expect 
uh, productivity growth to accelerate uh, rather than slow. What is the, who is, uh, uh, who is right in the debate uh, between uh, uh, techno-pessimists who say that uh, innovation has weakened and uh, the new, today's new technologies inherently, intrinsically, are uh, less consequential, consequential for uh, productivity than uh, past uh, technological breakthroughs such as uh, electrification, uh, internal combustion engine. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, techno-optimists who say no, uh, digital technologies and uh, continuing new advances, uh, in particular in artificial intelligence, uh, are truly transformative in terms of their productivity growth potential. And uh, a burst in productivity growth is uh, delayed or constrained uh, only by various lags and, 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 and barriers. Regarding wages, the question is, why are they decoupling from uh, uh, productivity growth? causing a labor income share to fall and wage uh, inequalities to rise. Are there some common factors behind these productivity, wage, and income distribution trends? And what are the uh, implications for public policy? So these are the questions we have. And uh, we have a very uh, strong panel uh, with us today to uh, address these questions. Uh, uh, starting from my immediate left, we have uh, Heather Bushi, uh, who is Executive Director and Chief Economist at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Next, uh, we have uh, William Maloney, who is Chief Economist for Equitable Growth, Finance, and Institutions at the World Bank. Then uh, Cyril Schwellness, who is uh, uh, head of uh, Labor Market Workstream in uh, OECD's uh, Economics Department. And then uh, Jeremy Zettelmeyer, uh, who is Senior Fellow at the uh, Peterson uh, Institute for International Economics. I mean, you have their bios uh, in, the, in the event handout, and they were also posted online. So I will not go into the uh, details of the bios, but... Uh, uh, I would only say that uh, our panel today has uh, authoritative credentials to speak about the, uh, the questions uh, at hand. And also, uh, it so happens that uh, each of them has recently uh, published a book on, uh, on related issues. On productivity, uh, Bill Maloney has co-authored the book, uh, which is here, uh, Productivity Revisited, uh, Shifting Paradigms in Analysis and Policy. And uh, Jeremy Zettelmeyer has co-edited the book, Facing Up to Low Productivity Growth, which actually has been published just this week uh, by Peterson Institute. Uh, on wages and inequality, uh, Cyril Schwellis is a lead author of the latest uh, OECD Economic Outlook, uh, which has a special focus on the issue of uh, productivity uh, wage uh, decoupling. And, uh, and Heather Bushi, who co-edited uh, the book, After Piketty, The Agenda for Economics and Inequality. This is heftier. <laughs> this is here. Uh, so, uh, so we have uh, four recent books on, on these issues, which I would highly recommend that you look at if you haven't already. So without further ado, let me uh, turn uh, to our panelists. We will first have a discussion within the panel for about, uh, for up to an hour, uh, which should uh, leave us a good amount of time for uh, questions uh, from the floor. So let me uh, turn first to the uh, issue of productivity uh, and, and to, uh, to Bill. Uh, Bill, from the vantage point of your recent book, uh, how do you see the uh, productivity paragraph? Uh, why 
Why do we see this paradox? What factors explain the slowdown in productivity amid uh, a seeming boom in, in, in new technologies? In your book, you discuss improvements in uh, product productivity data and uh, analytics, uh, what you call the, uh, the second wave of uh, productivity analysis. What new light uh, does this second wave shed on the uh, productivity dynamics that we have seen and, and we are seeing? Uh, at the firm level, uh, do the data show an increasing productivity divide between uh, successful firms at the uh, technological frontier and the vast majority of other firms uh, uh, whose productivity has slowed or, or is uh, stagnating. So frontier firms, productivity remains robust. The vast majority of other firms, it's producti uh, severe productivity slowdown or, or, or stagnation. Uh, Recent OECD analysis and a similar, uh, uh, another recent analysis shows that that is indeed the case, that there is this increasing divergence in productivity across firms, which is uh, bringing down average aggregate uh, productivity growth. If, if that is correct, uh, that would suggest that uh, it's not innovation that has weakened, as claimed by uh, techno-pessimists. Uh, uh, but rather it's diffusion across firms. So in other words, it's not that the innovation engine has slowed, uh, but uh, it's the uh, diffusion engine that has slowed. So uh, from your recent work, if you would uh, provide your perspective on this. Thank you. Thank you, Zia. Thank all of you for coming. Um, <clears throat> The uh, issue of productivity, obviously, I'm, I'm from the World Bank. We deal mostly with developing countries, but nonetheless, uh, you see that developing country growth and productivity growth tracks advanced country growth um, reasonably well, so that if we can e expect a slowdown in productivity growth in the advanced countries, uh, sooner or later, that is transmitted to lower growth in the developing countries, and that makes it harder to... Uh, eliminate the remaining pockets of poverty that we're, we're going after. Um, as a result of that, uh, we started a, something we're calling a productivity project, which right now is a three-volume series, but it's going to be a fourth and a fifth coming on, uh, looking at various different aspects of productivity and how we should be thinking about it. And this particular volume we call Second Wave um, Productivity Analysis because over the last 15 years, there's been a lot of rethinking of how we should conceptualize productivity, what we're talking about, and how we infer causality about uh, productivity, what's driving it, and uh, the causes as well. Um, and so, at least from the point of view of our practitioners, and the, uh, it's been very important to walk through these changes and, uh, and see a little bit how they shed light on um, on the advanced country productivity growth, but then also to explain the bigger question for our, us, which is why developing countries don't uh, catch up as fast, faster than they do, um, which is what I'll call the trillion-dollar question. Um, so briefly, one, one aspect that, that is uh, revisited is when we talk about TFP growth, what are we talking about? And frequently we think, okay, that's just efficiency gains. But when you break it out more carefully, and, and this is what part of the second wave is doing, it includes things like quality growth. It includes things like market power, both bad market power um, and, uh, and good market power that comes if I have a good idea, a good trademark, I, uh, I get uh, higher value added. That, that's good. And that all winds up in our TFP calculations as we normally do them. So that changes our priorities a little bit from the point of view of practitioners about what we're looking at. Um, but it also makes some of the inference to date about what drives productivity ups and downs a little more suspect, because if I have a trade liberalization that can affect both efficiency, it also affects the amount of rents I get as a producer, and those two things can move in opposite directions and cause us to uh, make uh, the wrong inference about what the impact of, for instance, trade liberalization on productivity is. 
Another aspect of the second wave has been revisiting the role of distortions in the economy and how much we should be focusing on that. Um, uh, Pete Klinow and Shang Tai She wrote a very influential paper about 15 years ago arguing that you could use the dispersion of TFP. And Zia is telling me I'm getting too technical, and I'll stop that. Um, and we can therefore look at distortions in the economy that are preventing the reallocation of resources from those laggard firms to those faster moving firms and how that can happen. Um, there's been a lot of reconsideration of that on conceptual grounds and uh, a lot of, and subsequently on empirical grounds, what we can really say from that and how much we can say, no, this is a problem of distortions in the business environment that's causing this slowdown. Um, that's what's driving it. Um, and that's been important because uh, one of the hypotheses about why we've seen this slowdown is precisely an increase in the kind of regulations um, that are uh, increasing um, according to theory, throughout, the, through, throughout the advanced world. There's a, a problem here, which is that the productivity slowdown has been coordinated across all the major countries. Social policy has not been, labor policy has not been, competitive policy has not been, competition policy has not been. So there's a little bit of an issue there of mm, how, how far can we really go with this? And as a result, I think, I mean, uh, John Halter Wanger has, you know, thinks that that is a very important element, and I think he's probably right, but whether that's going to get us all the way we need to go, I think, is suspect. And that kind of gets us to, to some other things, like, well, it could be the composition of our spending in the economy. As we get richer, we spend less on manufacturing, which is manufactured goods, which are really easy to engineering, to engineer a productivity increase, and much more on string quartets, and rock groups, which will always require four people. Um, uh, so productivity just cannot go up, whether it's Led Zeppelin or the Cronus Quartet. It's going to be four people. Um, so um, that is an important element that we've got to work on, and that gives us Balmo's cur curse. But that, again, can't explain everything we've seen. And so there's been a lot of look at, at, at mismeasurement. Um, and again, though, it's not been so much the kinds of measurement of the second wave thing about how we're measuring productivity per se. It tends to be things like, are we really measuring the contribution of YouTube, of these other new, new tech, digital technologies and things? And Chad Siverson says, OK, well, let's give it the, most, the largest contribution that could come from this. And it doesn't come close to uh, explaining the slowdown. Recently, uh, another paper with Siverson, Rock, and Brynjolfsson has come up with what, like, what they call the J curve. You know, why is it we have all these, uh, all these um, new, mm, you know, technology? Uh, what am I, why, why can't I think of the word? Uh, uh, well, very advanced technologies for searching data sets. I'm like, I can't, can't slip my mind right now. It must be uh, old age. And the, th the fact is that in any new technology, there are a bunch of accompanying things, accompanying factors that have to go along. And that takes a long time to build up. And so Siverson and company are arguing, look, what's probably going on here is simply that, um, that uh, we're, not, we're, we're throwing all those investments into costs, but we're not getting any kick out of it now. So we're underestimating TFP now, but give us 20, uh, t 10 years, and we're going to see big increases in, in TFP. Um, that we can't know. That's an incipient uh, part of the literature right now. Um, but in the end, I think the real question comes down to, at least from my point of view, as to kind of where Zio is going, have we really seen a slowdown in the arrival of important new technological uh, advances? Or whether you take Gordon's point of view, yeah, where you take Gordon's point of view that everything that was really cool to invent, we invented at the beginning of the century, and everything else is now shiny but inconsequential. Um, and um, I think that's probably uh, too pessimistic a view from, from our point of view. If you look from 1900 to about 1920, the rate of productivity growth is roughly the same as it is now. Somehow from about 1919 to 1973, there was a doubling of productivity growth for about f those chunk of decades. And this recent productivity slowdown isn't since the crisis. And it's not even just before the crisis. It's from the 70s, OK? So these are very long movements that we have to explain in productivity growth. And those very long movements are probably exactly related to you know, agglomerations of new technologies that come on and are worked through the system. And there are various different estimates. How long did it take for the IT revolution to work through the first wave? 
about 20 years is the best guess, okay? Um, and then Chad Silver says, yeah, not only that, though, if you look at earlier things, there were multiple waves. The same technology kicks in first here and then kicks in again 10, 20 years later. So we maybe see multiple waves. So the question, so the question is whether you think these new technologies, and we're not talking about YouTube, uh, which you can wave away, but things like CRISPR, this ability to sequence genes you know, and slice them up and now we know, you know, clone humans, and the, or these all new technologies which are not only giving us entire new industries, I mean, vast new industries, but there are also new tools for discovery. So we can expect the, a tremendous, uh, tremendous increase in the rate of discovery going forward and the rate of discovery of more consequential investments. And you throw on the fact that, whether we like it or not, there are other big countries in the world that are coming online in terms of very good scientists, and they're inventing stuff too. And we may be unhappy if they take our electric car, but if they discover the cure for cancer, that will be very nice of China to do. Um, so, um, and we see a greater linkage and a greater, there's a, a division of labor globally in terms of research and science. You see the major multinationals from Taiwan and the United States, for instance, outsourcing intermediate level R&D tasks to China and to, to India. So this is this efficiency gains coming not only from the rise of uh, this tremendous increase in the stock of um, of new scientists, but also just from the, how they are deployed globally that I think are also going to kick in um, to uh, increase the rate of discovery of consequential technologies. So I'm bullish, if you can't tell, um, and I have to be because uh, I have a lot of people still in poverty we have to pull out, and that needs, means the big countries need to grow fast. Um, but I think that none of the new things in terms of the new measurement issues that we've come we've been discussing recently in the literature, really have come close to sorting out why it is we see the slowdown right now. We can say something about the crisis, fine. But I really think that uh, in the long run, this is a question of working through these new, working these new technologies through the system and seeing what they give us. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to uh, Jeremy uh, now. Uh, uh, if you could uh, please focus on the uh, relationship between uh, uh, competition and productivity slowdown. Uh, do, do you see uh, uh, a weakening of competition in markets as an important factor in the uh, productivity slowdown that we have seen? And also the uh, concurrent uh, sluggishness in investment uh, despite uh, low borrowing costs uh, and high corporate profits. There are various indicators uh, uh, that uh, that show uh, that uh, competition in markets uh, has weakened, uh, a rise in market concentration and monopoly power, and increasing concentration of profits at the top end, boosted by higher markups and monopoly rents, uh, prompting uh, some to call our era uh, 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 a new uh, robber baron era or a new gilded age. Uh, in the U.S., market concentration has increased uh, over the past couple of decades practically in all sectors uh, of the economy. Uh, and these, these trends are more uh, 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 pronounced in the uh, more technology-intensive sectors. So there is a shift in markets toward uh, less competition, increased monopoly power, uh, more oligo uh, oligopolistic uh, structures. Uh, uh, are there, I mean, first, do you see the link between uh, uh, these developments in markets and the productivity dynamics that we see the slowdown? And also related to that, are there forces inherent in the new technologies that uh, produce uh, uh, dominant firms, superstar firms, uh, winner-take-all outcomes, uh, factors such as uh, first-mover advantages, network effects, uh, economies of scale, the, the leverage that comes with big data, uh, uh, regulatory advantage. So if you could address that, uh, uh, that, uh, that relationship uh, between the competition in markets and productivity dynamics. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so maybe to start with the second point, uh, so there are definitely these forces, but so in other words, we, we have a type of technological innovation, particularly in the Internet platforms, that uh, where 
there is a specific type of increasing returns to scale, so to speak, which are these these network uh, externalities. It's just efficient uh, to have lots of users on the same platform, and that will tend to reduce competition, but it will do it efficiently, right? That's the that's the trick. And, and so, you know, while this may contribute to the uh, concentration, at least in some industries that has been observed, it couldn't really explain the the productivity slowdown, unless, of course, you know, that market power is then abused with respect uh, to additional markets um, which don't have these efficiency gains, right? And that's, in principle, something that uh, competition authorities can, can prevent. I think they have, they have any instruments. So, so while I think that, you know, the superstar phenomenon is a relevant phenomenon, I don't think it can explain, first of all, concentration increases across many, many industries, particularly in the U.S. Second, the observed correlation between uh, concentration increases and the productivity slowdown. It just doesn't go uh, the right uh, uh, way. So there's something else that might be going on, So, to, or has to be going on. So to, to your broader question, you know, how much is this competition story a contributor? Um, so, you know, uh, Bill doesn't know, and I know less, less than Bill, so I, I don't really know. It, my sense is this is part of the story in the U.S., and we have some pretty good papers uh, in the U.S. that document this. I'm not sure how much what, what, the over, what the contribution to the overall story is, even in the U.S., and I'm not sure how much it contributes to the, to the global story. So with respect to the global story, I, I have seen a little bit of contradictory evidence on that, but m my sense is that the increase in concentration is, is particularly a U.S. phenomenon. It's not as much of an issue in, in Europe. So there's a data by Thomas Philippon that sh shows that essentially concentration is flat uh, in, in Europe. Markets have not uh, really gone down much. So it's, again, you know, since the productivity slowdown is a global phenomenon, competition cannot be the main story, or it would have to, had to go in the same direction uh, everywhere, and at least in terms of extent, is it has not. Uh, and then, as far as the U.S. is concerned, you know, I'm, I'm kind of with, with Bill that if you look at these, I mean, the basic regularities in these productivity cycles, these are long cycles, and there is, it's, it's hard to think that unless you have a true sort of sea change in a factor that drives competition, you can switch from one cycle to the next because of competition uh, changes, right? And as I said, you know, for me, the, the um, uh, network ex externalities are not the game changer because they do not explain what's going on in many, uh, in, in many industries, and then they, they, they produce the wrong cor correlation. So, so I don't think is, this is sort of the, the main story, but I think it could be an important uh, story. And, and so there are a bunch of papers that document that. And the nice thing about this, this story is that we, we know how to think about it, right? So that always helps. So there's less of a mystery here because we are more in the sort of realm that we are used to thinking about as economists. And so basically there, there, there are two channels. One is a decline in, in business uh, investment, so competitive pressure or less competitive pressure would lead profitable firms to invest less and just sit on their, uh, on their, on their rents. Um, and that is something we do observe. Uh, and then a decline in business dynamism, right? So that could be the, the other story. So one, one is that investment goes down, so, you know, labor productivity would go, go down because the uh, production becomes less capital intensive than in a more competitive environment. The other story is about entry and exit. Uh, so business dynamism uh, goes down because of uh, lower competition, or it is a, a way of describing lower to competition, and that in terms would reduce uh, total factor productivity growth, basically by allowing less productive firms to exist for a, for a longer time. And so we have some really nice papers. There's a very nice one by um, Germán Gutiérrez and Thomas Philippon from NYU that actually finds sort of a causal um, uh, relationship between competition and uh, both the decline in, in uh, 
uh, in, in investment and the decline in, in business dynamism uh, using sort of natural experiments and, and also some, some other econometric uh, techniques. And it's broadly consistent with the other set of work that Bill already mentioned by Ryan Decker and, and John Haltewey and co-authors who, who first of all confirm that the decline in business dynamism, so lower entry and exit, has contributed to the productivity slowdown in the U.S., and then also uh, in another paper uh, document that the decline is, is mainly a result of declining in, in the responsiveness of entry and exit to, to shocks rather than having uh, actually less shocks. So then, you know, the million-dollar question is why does concentration go up? Um, and so, like I said before, you know, the, I, I view the evidence as being inconsistent, at least with a pure superstorm firm view, which then would uh, uh, basically have the opposite prediction on how concentration should be correlated with productivity and investment across uh, industry. So that, that would be sort of the good market power story that, that Bill uh, told. And, and so that sort of leaves you with um, an al alternatives that could have to do with either regulation, uh, so there could be uh, just more barriers to entry f through regulation, or possibly competition enforcement, so how competition authorities uh, uh, actually um, operate. And, and so there's uh, some evidence uh, for both of these stories. Uh, in particularly, there's sort of a nice contrast between Europe and the U.S., right? So, so Europe, of course, on regulation. Uh, if you don't like regulation, Europe is, is worse uh, than the U.S. On competition enforcement, it's been tougher uh, than the U.S. So there is a, a generally a move towards laxer competition enforcement that has happened here, but not in Europe. And you know, conveniently, it's also true that investment broadly has held up better in Europe uh, than in the U.S. So if you put all this together, so it has some nice implications. And one particularly nice implication, which is drawn in a paper by Jason Furman and, and Peter Orzak that's in our book, is this idea that maybe the decline in productivity growth and the increase in wage inequality are sort of two sides of the same coin because they both could have to do with more concentration for whatever reasons, but maybe particularly for these regulatory or enforcement reasons. So on, on one hand, you have less investment, less entry and exit. On the other hand, you have bigger rents. These rents are then, you know, first of all, they lead to a higher share of capital with respect to labor, but also importantly, they lead to increasing wage inequality because some of these rents are passed on to the firms that earn the rents, whereas the firms that do not earn the rents are poorer and, and pay their workers less. And so there's also a lot of evidence consistent with the story that the increases in wage inequality in the U.S. have to do with cross-firm or cross-establishment differences in pay, right? Not so much across professions, uh, and, and that's a, a, a nice way of, of tying these uh, stories together. So I, I think it's a relevant story. I'm not sure it's, it's the, the story that explains the productivity slowdown. Thank you. Uh, I think you, you're right. The, uh, the trend toward uh, weakening of uh, market competition uh, seems to be uh, much more pronounced uh, in the U.S. And a couple of numbers uh, that may be of interest to you uh, from recent research. Uh, work by uh, Eckertson and others recently es estimated that the uh, the share of uh, monopoly rents uh, in U.S. national income uh, rose from uh, as low as around 3% uh, in 1985 to almost one-fifth in 2015. That's a whopping increase. And uh, another study, uh, this one uh, by uh, Monica Kurz at Stanford, uh, estimates that the share of uh, total U.S. stock market value, uh, which he estimates uh, reflects a monopoly power, what he calls monopoly wealth, that uh, that share uh, of total U.S. stock market value uh, has risen to as high as 80 percent from negligible levels around 1985. Uh, so, so one can quibble about some of these numbers, uh, but uh, but they, they they show an unmistakable trend, certainly in the context uh, of the U.S. economy. Uh, let me turn now to uh, to Cyril uh, on uh, what's been happening to, uh, to 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 on the wage side. Uh, I mean, Cyril, your work at the OECD shows that productivity growth has slowed. Uh, 
uh, but uh, but at the same time, wages have decoupled from productivity, and they have been uh, growing uh, even more slowly, with labor income share falling and and wage uh, inequality rising. So, what are the factors that you see uh, behind these outcomes? Uh, is it technological change uh, favoring uh, capital and more sophisticated uh, worker skills? Uh, globalization and offshoring, uh, rise of market power as, and winner-take-all dynamics as we just touched on, weakening of labor market institutions, uh, and combination of all of these perhaps. Uh, and also are the, uh, and I think Jeremy just touched on this, uh, are the slowdown in uh, productivity growth uh, and the, uh, the wage stagnation and decoupling that we uh, have seen, are they linked by common factors, common drivers? Okay. Um, thank you, Zia. So, you know, short answer, yeah, it's a combination of all these. But um, l let me just um, uh, maybe start with motivation of why we looked into um, this question of decoupling of, you know, middle wages, median wages from uh, productivity. So, you know, even if real wages perfectly tracked um, productivity, um, you know, the slowdown in productivity growth would be um, bad news for workers. But what we realized um, is that in many countries, by no means in all countries, um, uh, wages don't even track this uh, feeble rate of productivity growth. So, you know, in accounting terms, um, you know, that reflects declines in labor shares as average wages have um, decoupled from uh, productivity and um, increases in wage inequality as median wages have decoupled from um, average wages. Now, you know, you might wonder why um, are we concerned about this? No? Um, you know, after all, we know that, um, you know, the simple textbook model uh, by which um, wages are equal to um, revenue productivity is not, uh, doesn't hold in, in, in reality. So I think there are two reasons why um, we care about this. So one is we care about the market distribution of income. Um, and um, clearly a decline in, in the wage share um, has an impact on the um, market distribution of income since um, capital, and therefore capital income, um, is very concentrated on population. So for many, many households um, in OCD countries, um, wages are the only source of, um, of market income. So you know, as a question of you know, how are these declines in labor shares linked with um, the distribution of market income? And I think a second uh, broader um, question is, um, and that motivates this work, is that actually, you know, this decoupling um, might tell us about, you know, more fundamental changes in the economy. So uh, up until the 1970s, I mean, for the countries for which we have data, um, Actually, the textbook model was pretty, pretty accurate. So um, median wages and average wages tended to follow um, productivity growth. So that indicates that you know, something fundamental might have changed. So maybe, as Zia said, um, you know, technological change might have become more labor displacing. There might be um, an increase in, in market power. Uh, so in your competition-related rents, as Jeremy said, or there might also be, um, you know, as Robert Solow uh, tends to argue, you know, a change in the um, social contract by which, you know, um, there is um, a change in how we should um, distribute uh, market rents between um, workers and um, capital owners. So, you know, second part of the question... Um, so, so what are the drivers? And so, so I think, you know, f from my point of view, I mean, we have to be very humble about what we can actually say. So it's very difficult in empirical terms to distinguish between the effects of um, trade, um, technological change, and institutional change. So everything happens at the same time. Um, so empirically, I mean, there are limits of what we can say. And obviously, you know, trade and technological change, they're linked so, you know, we should be humble about what we can say, but, you know, how we approach this is that, 
Um, obviously, these changes, technological change, um, globalization, institutional change, don't happen at the same time in all the countries, in all industries. So can, you can use this variation across industries and countries you know, to, to get a rough idea of uh, the quantitative orders of magnitude. So what we find here is you know, the drivers of this decoupling uh, are a combination of global factors and um, more domestic uh, country-specific factors. So in the group of the global factors, there's technological change, which we measure by um, you know, the change in investment prices, which over the, our sample period are mainly changes in ICT equipment. So we look you know, in our empirical an analysis from the 1990s to uh, around uh, 2015. And we find that technological change you know, has not only been skill biased, but it has also been um, uh, labor displacing in the sense that um, these declines in uh, the price of investment goods um, lead to a substitution of capital uh, for labor and you know the capital intense the increase in capital intensity which we would expect to lead to um, real wage gains has actually only led to a moderate wage gain so that's one fact a technological change that becomes um, uh, labor displacing to some extent um, a second factor you know is offshoring uh, so you know the offshoring of the most um, labor intensive stages of production abroad uh, which also leads similarly to you know um, uh, production becoming more uh, capital intensive and not necessarily leading to um, uh, big wage gains, perhaps also because, you know, this offshoring changes um, uh, the relative bargaining position of uh, workers and capital owners. So quantitatively what we find is that, uh, you know, both these effects are at play, but... Um, you know, the effect of technological change is about, you know, on average, three times bigger or explains three times what um, um, the um, offshoring explanation can explain. And that might be because, um, you know, up to now, offshoring has mainly affected the manufacturing sector, whereas, um, you know, technological change, you know, the ICT revolution has been um, affecting both manufacturing and services. Um, so you know, that's the global factors. But um, in terms of domestic factors, um, uh, there are, of course, what, uh, what Zia said, there's uh, differences in, in labor market institutions. And, you know, what we really need to um, understand is that, you know, this decoupling has not been, you know, homogeneous across countries. So um, there are big differences across countries. In the U.S., in Japan... To some extent, um, uh, over some periods in Germany, we've seen big um, declines in labor shares, uh, increases in wage inequality. Um, but in other countries, we don't. So, you know, the UK, we don't observe that. In France, we don't observe that. So it's, it's not totally generalized. So there must be some country-specific stuff going on um, that can explain that. So, you know, labor market institutions are one part of the story. So... Um, I think uh, in some countries we've observed a weakening of labor market uh, policy and institutions like uh, employment protection, um, collective bargaining, you know, which in many countries has become more decentralized. In some countries we've also seen a, a, a decline in minimum wages, and all this um, might contribute uh, also to uh, declines in labor shares and uh, increases in wage inequality. But I want to focus on... Um, uh, an additional explanation that can, to some extent, um, explain differences uh, across countries, which is differences in firm dynamics. So what in our research, what we, what we observe is that in countries in which the labor share has declined, um, you know, new firms with very high productivity and very low labor shares displace um, firms at the technological front, incumbent firms at the um, technological frontier. And um, so that, you know, since these new firms at the technology frontier have very low labor shares, um, that, 
contribute to the labor share decline. And it might, to some extent, uh, reflect when I take most dynamics as, um, as um, Jeremy has already discussed. So I have to speed up, so I'm going to get to the third part of the question, which is um, why, um, you know, whether these um, developments in productivity, so productivity slowdown and uh, the decoupling of median wages from productivity are linked. And uh, so I think um, one interesting observation is that, you know, the decline in productivity growth and um, the decoupling have coincided with um, growing performance gaps in terms of revenue productivity, as Bill said. So it's not really just, you know, we would like to measure physical productivity, but we measure uh, revenue productivity have coincided with growing performance gaps and revenue productivity. And so here there are two stories, right? As uh, Jeremy already said, um, they may, you know, on the one hand, it might be a pure technology explanation. So might be growing performance gaps between firms, the technological leases and the rest, because there are barriers to um, technology diffusion, okay, because of whatever, uh, complement, there, there's a need for complementary investments to, uh, to, um, to adopt new technologies, and that might um, lead to, to some divergence across firms. Um, and I think there's the second, um, second explanation, which uh, Jérôme has focused on, is increased uh, market power. So, um, you know, the successful firms... Uh, you know, take advantages of economies of scale, economies of scope to raise their productivity, but also gain a dominant market position and might be able to raise their markups. And, um, you know, that might be a reward to an innovation, so it would be a good thing. It would be the efficient uh, uh, response to, um, you know, to t technological change. Um, I think... You know, I'm more positive about this explanation than Jeremy, but there's, of course, yeah, the um, um, explanation that it reflects anti-competitive forces. So, um, you know, we've observed that there's declining business dynamism, uh, there's increasing M&A activity, and uh, so that might also drive rents. But, um, you know, maybe we can get back to this uh, discussion later. Thanks. Thank you, Cyril. Um, uh, Heather, uh, your recent work is focused on uh, major focus on inequality, uh, employment, and wages in the U.S. So, if you could please focus on uh, the case of the U.S., uh, some of the trends that we uh, uh, Cyril was just talking about: uh, the uh, the productivity wage de uh, decoupling, uh, uh, the fall in labor income share, the rise in wage inequality, the rise in overall income inequality. And these trends have been much more pronounced in the U.S. Uh, than in some of the uh, uh, other uh, major economies. Why is that so? How do you, how do you see that? Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, we're a leader in so many ways here in the United States um, on inequality and, and so many other things. Um, let me uh, thank you very much. This is an, uh, I've actually learned a lot already on this panel, and um, fortunately, so that we can keep on time, some of the uh, ideas that I wanted to touch on on competition and um, concentration have already been elevated, so I can go over that part briefly. But um, at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, we have spent the past five years investigating the question of whether and how inequality affects economic outcomes. Um, we funded um, over 180 scholars, have given away about four and a half million dollars, investigating various aspects of this question. And so what I want to actually t weave into my answer here is some of the research findings that we've discovered that get at this question of the intersection between inequality and productivity. But I'll start with just a few things about inequality and why it's so different in the U.S., um, so the United States is clearly an outlier, you know, for many decades, certainly when I was coming up to graduate school and beyond, the big answer for why we had rising inequality in the United States was because of skill-biased technological change, because technological change was um, uh, moving in a direction that meant that there was more demand for higher skilled workers, less demand for less skilled workers. This was what was pulling apart the U.S. labor market. But um, increasingly, there is 
uh, more and more evidence that this is not an adequate explanation for what's been happening. Um, you see, and you've you've uh, brought my very heavy um, book there after Piketty, as I was saying to Bill, it's seven pages shorter than the original. Um, but Thomas Piketty's work with Emmanuel Saez and many other scholars has documented that in the U.S., it isn't just that inequality has risen, but that we've seen this pulling apart of people at the very, very top of the income spectrum in ways that we haven't seen for over a century and in ways that really make us an outlier internationally. But it's not just along the lines of income. It's also along the lines of wealth. And I think therein lies some... Uh, where a lot of the new research and evidence is pointing to an intersection between these trends in income inequality, the trends in wealth inequality, rising economic concentration, and what this means for uh, for wages and productivity. So one um, one other implication of rising inequality in the United States is that the U.S. has also seen lower economic mobility. So the probability that a kid born in 1980 is out earning his or her parents today is a little over half the probability as it was for somebody born in 1940. This is from research by Thomas Chetty and a number of other folks. I see Bill like nodding, yes, we've all, we're sort of familiar with this. Yeah, supporting yeah no, no, but I mean, I mean, it's good. Like, so this is like this is a new fact about the U.S. economy, and of course, one of the um, one of the things that they found in that research is that um, the biggest reason, or that 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 in order to have seen higher mobility, we would have had to see much less inequality in recent years. That that's really a part of this problem with mobility. And um, I want to point, sort of in making the link to productivity, to another piece of research also by Chetty that we helped fund at Equitable Growth with a a team of amazing scholars, um, where they looked at what leads to people becoming innovators. And I know that Chetty spoke about that here at Brookings about a year year and a month ago. Um, But what they found is that if you, and actually before I say what they found, let me describe their data because it's super cool and interesting. They had data on individuals who filed for or received patents, their income. They also had data on that person's test scores when they were in third grade and that person's parental income when they were in third grade, along with their race and gender. A lot and millions of observations. And so the first thing they found was, you know, quite sort of sensible that if you actually scored good on your third grade math test, much more likely to grow up and become an innovator. Seems perfectly logical to me, right? Then when they overlaid the other data they had, they found that the probability of becoming an innovator, even if you scored high on those third grade grade tests, was vastly reduced if you came from a non-wealthy family. And that data point in terms of how inequality is affecting productivity, I think it's very, for me, I find it very palpable, right? And now we can have a long conversation about what patents mean. So setting that aside for a minute, happy to talk about that if we get to the Q&A. But what that means is that because of inequality, there are millions of smart young kids Um, whose opportunity is being obstructed in some way from becoming the innovators that they could be in our economy. Now, I am not an expert on international comparisons of innovation or productivity. Many of the the other folks here on the panel are. But I do know that the United States is, is and has been a leader in innovation. And if our high inequality today is leading to these obstructions, for for kids and uh, uh, from low income families and women and people of color because those are both also overlaid in this particular study, then that could be having um, a very important effect both in the United States and worldwide. That's just one of the pieces of evidence of the ways that there is this intersection between inequality and productivity and growth. Now, one of the interesting um, studies that a number of folks have pointed to, I think, German, um, a, a chapter in the book that you wrote by uh, Jason Furman and Peter Orzag, uh, points to this, um, uh, kind of rejects a little bit the idea that inequality is leading to declining productivity in favor of the answer that it's actually because there might be a common cause, which is this rising concentration. And um, I won't repeat what other folks have said up here, but I hope as you walk away from this panel, the idea that rising economic concentration and that there are now piles of papers, of research papers that are making a very coherent case that that inequality, 
is a really important piece of the puzzle is, I hope, a takeaway for you all. One thing I want to underscore is that it isn't just the rising concentration across firms, but the rising concentration in ownership across firms, because we're seeing that as well. And this is a new sort of cutting edge place of the literature. Um, a number of working papers, some published, but really sort of where the, the next generation is, that because you have um, a small number of people who are owning majority stakes in a large number of firms in a particular industry, that too is having this effect. And of course, the, um, uh, these, are, these are all connected um, when you look at the data. So. Um, the da, 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 da. so I think that you know first I do think that there is evidence um, that that the U.S. is an outlier in our inequality trends that can't be explained by the traditional ways that we've thought about them. That the way that inequality looks in the United States, there's growing evidence, and I've just given you one data point that it is obstructing the factors that lead to productivity and growth. Um, and um, in a variety of ways, both inside firms and across um, human capital development, but also this way that the rising concentration is subverting the processes that lead to growth. And with that, I'll pause. Uh, so let me uh, turn uh, quickly to uh, uh, what the uh, policy implications of some of these trends and uh, uh, analyses are. Uh, uh, might be, and uh, so if we can take just no more than three minutes each, because we want to leave some uh, some time for for questions. So first, uh, uh, Bill, uh, with respect to uh, the productivity paradox, uh, how can uh, technological change be uh, harnessed better to produce uh, better productivity outcomes? and uh, more broadly shared productivity outcomes, that there is a, uh, it's not just the firms at the frontier uh, 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 achieving productivity growth, but more broadly that there is more diffusion. Now, of course, the agenda varies from across countries, but uh, what would be uh, some of the main sort of headline uh, messages uh, from your analysis on that? So, you, you, we, we tend to think of technological diffusion as something abstract. Someone has a great idea and it diffuses. Um, and what's missing there is, of course, that somebody, a, a human operating in some context, is doing the diffusing. Um, so uh, part of a barrier to diffusion within the advanced countries can be exactly these kinds of distortions or... Uh, increased industrial concentration, for instance, that prevents people from coming in, da, da, da. all those things could um, be partly barriers. And certainly in the developing world, if you think about what we call the, um, the enabling environment or the operating environment, there are many, many things which are missing, which a person who had identified an idea and uh, abroad that wanted to take to a developing country and implement it would find a barrier, uh, would find barriers to them actually implementing that idea and, uh, and diffusing it throughout uh, their local context. But one of the things we stress is that's not the whole story, and that's a little bit what we're pushing against, that it's all in the operating environment, it's all in the supporting environment, that a lot has to do with human capital. Um, and, but human capital, not as we're talking about in the human capital index of you know, secondary education, just what it takes to actually be an entrepreneur who has the capability of identifying a new idea, understanding the potential for profitability, undertaking uh, a risk analysis of how risky it's going to be and what he can do to mitigate those risks. Um, and, um, and that actually is a very advanced set of skills. And as technology becomes more and more complex, you can imagine that the set of skills to really evaluate what... Um, um, what AI can do for my uh, company is going to be increasing over time, and understanding the risks around it, or the, how the market, how your market is going to be changing as a result of this, is going to be require more and more capabilities on the part of the entrepreneurs, as we call them. Um, so, uh, and at the same time, when we're talking about, uh, well, we have to keep in mind that any such decision to try to import a technology, to try to diffuse, to take a technology and into my firm or to my country, is fundamental, fundamentally an informed bet. You know, this is risk, okay? And we have to think that 
development in general and growth in general is a bunch of people placing bets. Um, so we really have to think about, uh, particularly in the kind of countries I deal with, it, how well we have done in terms of creating experimental societies. That is where the environment enables people to learn about new possibilities, new bets they could take, and helps them mitigate um, and manage risk. Um, and that's on the one hand. On the other hand, the other part of these experimental societies is precisely individuals who are capable of taking those risks. Um, and that requires all those capabilities I was just discussing. Um, and I think we have to work on both hands. I think my beloved institution has been a little bit guilty of focusing entirely on the enabling environment. And that once we get rid of all the distortions, boom, everyone's going to take these ideas from the US and UK and France and take them to uh, Ghana. Um, it takes a special kind of person to make that happen, too, and I think we need to be focusing more and more on that. Uh, and I think that's both in the developing world, but I also think to manage the new kind of technologies that come along, it's, it's, it's a lot harder than saying, oh, I see if we take a new one of these new motors and harness it to some bicycle parts, we can make a car. That's a different kind of technological adoption in 1930 uh, than what we've got today. Um, uh, uh, Jeremy, uh, from the uh, uh, vantage point of uh, your recent book that focuses on the uh, potential consequences of a sustained slowdown uh, in uh, productivity growth, how do you see the uh, policy implications of uh, slower productivity growth in terms of uh, whether uh, we focus on uh, reversing the slowdown, uh, uh, in other words, mitigation, or on living with it, uh, in other words, uh, adaptation. Uh, and, and on competition policy, you will, uh, competition, you have already addressed that, but from uh, your, uh, given your European perspective, you worked in German government uh, and EPRD, uh, how do you see the, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, com competition policy agenda uh, playing out in Europe in terms of uh, any, uh, any significant uh, developments there? Uh, Th thanks a lot. So let, let me make three points. So the first is about this, um, what we call adaptive policy changes. So basically in this book, we went through a, policy, a thought experiment, which is to say, you know, if uh, the productivity slowdown was sustained in the sense that we keep seeing mediocre, low productivity growth essentially frozen at the average level since the Great Recession continue for another 20 years, what would happen to the world, right? Apart from the obvious thing, that is, we, we would be uh, poorer relative to the counterfactual. And, and so, you know, the, if you go through these experiments, first, that we would have more fiscal pressures, uh, because even though we would expect to live in a lower interest environment, some of you know primary uh, expenditures, like related to uh, to poverty or uh, expenditures that are indexed to inflation and as such do not go down when productivity growth goes down. Uh, would go up, and some sources of revenue where productivity growth helps you. Uh, so in the U.S., for example, there's a thing called real bracket creep, which means revenues tend to go down, up with real growth. They wouldn't be there, so at the margin, it makes the U.S. fiscal problem in particular uh, worse. Uh, it creates also essentially a continuation of the low interest environment that we have lived in for a long time, which generates financial risks. It makes complicates the conduct of monetary policy, can lead uh, to, to bubbles. Um, and, of course, we argue that it's also this whole environment is conducive to high inequality to the extent that it has to do with, with concentration. And so, you know, what would you do? You know, you can think about policies that deal with the symptoms, uh, so to speak, which is, you know, you need to defend fiscal space. You don't want to give big tax cuts uh, in this type of environment, you want to strengthen automatic stabilizers to help monetary policy. You want to be particularly tough on uh, 
you know, macroprudential regulation or generally, you know, supervision of the financial sector to prevent these bubbles. You would want to rebalance uh, uh, maybe tax incentives to encourage labor force participation to sort of offset the slower wage growth. And, of course, you would want more redistributive tax systems. So, in other words, you want more or less the opposite uh, of what the Trump administration has been doing in the last couple of uh, years. Now, the, the point, though, is... And another important lesson from, from this work is to the extent that you think that, in fact, higher inequality and lower productivity growth are, are related, there is actually not much of a conflict between these sort of more adaptive policies and the types of policies that you would want to implement to push against the slowdown in productivity growth, right? So in particular, anything that helps competition is good for both, right? That sort of... Uh, music to Heather's ears, right? So this is, you know, it dissipates rents, it reduces the market power of firms uh, against each other firms and particularly against uh, workers. Uh, and, of course, competition also enhances innovation and uh, creates incentives to, uh, to invest. Anything that strengthens the bargaining power of workers from the point of view of improving their ability to move across firms is good. So it could be geographic labor mobility, it could be portability of... Healthcare, so single payer healthcare would be great in that respect. For example, I don't want to get uh, too too political, but it it would be good, you know, because it would um, essentially make um, increase business dynamism, uh, and at the same time, it would be uh, good for for productivity of of workers and uh, reduce uh, inequality. And um, uh, so, so that that is kind of that set of uh, implications. Now, on on final point on on competition. So, you would think that, in a sense, the fact that we are in this relatively rare situation where we are no longer in this sort of typical Washington consensus: are we for it or against it uh, thing, but we we sort of tend to think that. There's a whole important sets of policies that are both good for growth and both good for, for reducing inequality. You would think this makes you know, pro-competition, pro-mobility, pro-worker policies easier. Now, the, the big problem with this is that the whole um, economic nationalism stuff throws a wrench into this uh, favorable picture because you know, everyone's obsessed with how do we deal with China. And so this... China phenomenon is is triggering a backlash, uh, and in you know in many cases in Europe in particular, sort of an anti-competition uh, move because suddenly the priority is we need enormous firms uh, that we're going to have to subsidize with state money, or at least we need to allow their creation, uh, which means we need to weaken merger uh, law. And so, you know, right now it's, it's not looking uh, that pretty. Uh, the, so the political uh, environment for these types of reforms, particularly in areas of the world that have picked the low-hanging fruit, like in Europe we have pretty redistributive tax systems, we have a universal health care and all, all those sorts of things, tends to push uh, in, the, in the wrong direction. And so this is um, a, a battle that you're going to see uh, in the next um, a year or so. So the, the German government, for example, has just published a thing they call National Industrial Strategy 2030, which is, in a sense, the German answer to Made in China 2025, but also to Trump in some respects. It's sort of German-style uh, economic uh, nationalism. It, there's a big call for industrial policy there, which is completely, in this form, alien to the German tradition. It's closer to what the French have done. And there's the sense that, you know, maybe EU competition uh, policy, which we all view as, or at least I do, as a benefit, both for growth and, and for equality in, in Europe, maybe that's a problem, uh, that we need, we need to water that down to allow these, these big mergers. So there's a conflict point brewing there. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, uh, with respect to uh, labor market outcomes, uh, uh, Cyril, uh, as the digi digital, uh, digital revolution continues uh, and in the next phase uh, led by artificial intelligence, uh, are the decline in uh, labor market income, uh, rise in wage inequalities, uh, are these here to stay? Are these the new... Uh, 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 the stylized facts of the new digital economy. Uh, 
or are there policies that uh, uh, that uh, can achieve, achieve better results, both with respect to productivity and labor market outcomes? Uh, briefly, in, in three minutes, please. The, just the headlines. Well, I don't think I would have an answer if I had several hours, but um, uh, let me try to summarize in three minutes. Uh, so I think um, what artificial intelligence and, um, you know, I would add something else, remote intelligence will do. So um, the increased ease of telework across borders um, is that, you know, a lot of the things that have up to now affected the manufacturing sector are going to affect uh, white-collar jobs in the services sector. And um, so that's going to be a big change. You know, we don't know anything about uh, the long term. That's highly speculative. Um, you know, it's likely that in the long term that will lead to um, more productive jobs and better jobs, but the problem is the short term. And in the short term, you know, what we see is that... Um, the rate of job displacement uh, might actually outpace uh, the rate of job creation. And uh, so at the OCD, you know, we have a few numbers on, uh, you know, believe them or not, on, on um, the, um, the percentage of jobs that are um, at the risk of uh, disappearing. Um, and so more or less that's 10%. I mean, there are other estimates around that are higher. And, you know, and an, an additional significant share of jobs at risk of uh, changing very rapidly. And so, you know, what has to be done is to um, prepare both uh, workers and firms um, uh, for these changes. So, you know, we've already discussed a few worrying signs. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of firms are actually decoupling from the productivity frontier. So there's an increase in, in productivity dispersion, uh, increasing productivity gaps. We also see that um, the employment rate of low-skilled male um, people is declining across OCD countries, so not only in the U.S., across the OCD, and that you know, skills of people uh, remaining in, in employment, especially in you know, skills um, relating to um, working in um, a, a digital environment, are very, very weak. And... Uh, so that implies that, you know, I think for a, an ideal policy mix would be to um, support uh, the broad-based broad um, uh, adoption of technologies across all firms. And, you know, um, obviously one thing uh, you need for that is, as German already uh, discussed, is, you know, um, a good level of uh, product market competition, you know, easy entry and exit, um, into product, market, uh, um, uh, product markets, uh, easy access to finance. So one problem for technology adoption, I think, is that increasingly in the, in the digital age, um, uh, you know, intangible assets become more important, and it's you know you cannot use intangible assets as um, collateral. So a lot of firms don't have access uh, to finance to adopt these new technologies. Um, we need to promote managerial cap capacities of workers and firms. And um, th so that's one part of the ideal policy response. I think the second part is, you know, to have uh, a fairly um, generous wealth net to support workers who lose their jobs. Um, uh, you know, one example is Denmark. Uh, you know, they have very high uh, replacement rates, um, so uh, at very low levels of wages. So but the replacement rate is capped at 2,000 US dollars. So if you lose your job, you're uh, a low-skilled worker, um, you're supported. But you know, the third element is that you need to also activate these workers. You cannot just um, um, support them uh, through welfare, but you activate them through training policies, um, you know, job search, job counseling, relocation, um, and sometimes even uh, wage subsidies. So I think there's nothing really, um, really new about the policies we need. It's, um, you know, the vigorous um, implementation of these policies that we need in the digital age. Thank you. Uh, uh, last question, uh, Heather. Uh, 
uh, focusing uh, on the U.S. economy, how to achieve more inclusive outcomes. Uh, often uh, uh, discussions of uh, uh, policies uh, to improve equity uh, uh, focus narrowly uh, on redistribution, tax and transfer policies. Of course, they're important, uh, but there's a big agenda of uh, pre-distribution, how to make the growth process itself uh, more inclusive. Uh, so that leads you to uh, the, uh, the domain of reforms in product markets, labor markets, uh, upskilling, reskilling workers. How do you see, uh, briefly, uh, priorities from the U.S. standpoint uh, in, in, in that agenda? And then we'll take some questions. Yeah, I actually want to um, note back to something that you said in one of the introductions a little bit earlier on that, you know, over, I think it was you who said over the period from 1920 to 1973, we doubled productivity. Was that the stat that you growth. Doubled growth, right, from 19... Productivity growth. Productivity growth over this period. Um, the... The that period over which we saw this strong productivity growth and strong economic growth was, of course, also the period over which we saw less inequality. And we had stronger institutions that were creating a balance between competing economic powers. So I think that um, uh, we do need to shift our thinking in terms of... Um, where we want to start answering the question. So I like the the focus on the pre-distribution, the redistribution, because it gets us thinking um, what is the proper role of government, both in thinking about the tax and transfer system, but the role of government in terms of regulation, in terms of making sure that the market is fair, that market outcomes are um, uh, just, and that and that all that. There is evidence that we've talked about and that I think actually we could have done like a four-hour panel up here because I think there's a lot of evidence for the different ways that this intersection between inequality and um, productivity plays out. So let me just touch on a couple here. I mean, so first, uh, you know, one of the things that has changed uh, significantly in the United States is that there are now, in, as a share of the private sector, there are fewer people in a union in the United States than there were back before we made unions legal in uh, the 1930s. So um, there is no longer a balance um, within firms, within the economy, within the labor market, between the interests of workers and their ability to bargain on their behalf and what's happening in capital. When you combine that with the rising significant uh, concentration across firms and the wealth concentration and what that's done to our political process, that is a severe imbalance, not just on the shop floor, but uh, flowing throughout our economy. So I would start with figuring out how ways that you recreate that, that balance um, between labor and capital, be that traditional unions or other sorts of mechanisms. Um, and, uh, you know, whether or not we need other mechanisms, I think actually gets a little bit to the heart of this question about the, um, the, Rebecca, the, 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 you've said this so wonderfully, Rebac apocalypse. I think I've like added another syllable. Um, uh, which I think is a really, I mean, it's interesting to kind of throw that up to a panel here where we're talking about a productivity slowdown, but yet the robots are going to take all of our jobs. Those two ideas are, they don't make sense when you put them together and pushing us to really have that conversation. The way that I think about it, of course, is that the robots don't actually need income. Um, they don't need to feed themselves, right? That's what that's what people need. And how, if we actually are moving towards an economy where significant shares of workers are going to be redundant because we can mechanize those jobs in some way or another, you got robots doing it, AI. That is uh, that is a problem that actually. Um, uh, and I do not want to uh, include, diss any of my panelists up here, but I think it's beyond economists because this is a this would be a massive society wide problem that we need to be thinking about because uh, the humans are not going to sit aside and allow themselves to all become redundant without. Uh, getting a little bit frustrated with that. Um, but I do think thinking about what it means to have capital, I mean, right, so fundamentally when you're saying that the robots are taking all the jobs, it's because capital is replacing labor and it's taking all the income and it's not sharing, right? And that's an old problem. That's not a new problem. And we have a lot of policies that we can think about uh, on that. I want to actually get to two more. Um, one is just briefly... 
We've talked a lot about competition. I will say from the U.S. perspective, one of the biggest and most important agendas we need to pursue is antitrust enforcement. Um, you know, we live in an era where um, we need stronger presumptions against conduct that is likely to be anti-competitive, which is not where the current policy um, makers start. We need tougher standards against mergers, front page of today's paper. Um, we need better remedies for both government and private plaintiffs. And we need, of course, to ensure that the antitrust agencies that enforce the laws the United States are actually funded so that they can do their jobs. And as we've seen concentration increase, we've actually seen the funding for the agencies that work on that declining, and that makes no sense. And that, in the grand scheme of things, wouldn't be a lot of money. But then finally, um, one of the things that we have talked a little bit about up here on the panel is the role that government plays in productivity growth, the role that government plays through you know, everything from access to universal education and higher education to the investments that government makes like you know, in creating the internet and all sorts of other things that have created, you know, and sending a man to the moon that then in the United States created all of these positive externalities that allowed the private sector to take those and commercialize them. Um, the United States, of course, now is looking at a future where revenues, tax revenues, will be somewhere between 15 and 16 percent of U.S. GDP, which is a historic low. And we should be closer to where our economic competitors are, which is something around 22 percent of GDP. Um, let's just split the difference and call it, let's go for 20 percent. Um, we've been there before in the United States in eras when we were more... Uh, uh, competitive, um, had higher productivity growth. Um, but I think that's a missing plank here that we also need to be conscious and aware of. Uh, so we, uh, the floor is now open for questions. So we will take uh, three questions at a time. So uh, please identify yourself. Uh, keep your question short. And if you want to direct your question to a particular panelist, please identify the panelist. Thank you. Hi, I'm Glenn Westley, uh, ex-IDB and World Bank. Um, just a quick note as much as anything that having just finished Stephen Brill's tailspin, there's a lot of... Ex Tyrion, okay. Uh, having just finished Stephen Brill's tailspin, uh, the story of kind of the decline of the U.S. in the last 50 years, there's a lot of explanations for growing inequality that go way beyond economics. There are economics explanations, as well as uh, the other great book, and this is Hacker and Pearson's Winner Take All Politics. But uh, leave it at that. Uh, Kevin Finneran at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, all of you sort of touched on the fact that there are differences between sectors like manufacturing, industrial sectors, and some of the service sectors. I think particularly if we think about health care and education. But when we wind up talking about solutions and where we're going, it seems to me that most of the time we're addressing a model that apl applies to industry. Um, I'd like to hear people address a little bit more how they imagine productivity and wages working out in sectors like health care, education, um, care for the elderly in particular. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. My principal qualification for this is I was born in the 1940s. And I <laughs> lived through the Great Compression when productivity and wages were tightly coupled. <clears throat> that all ended in the 1980s. And wouldn't you agree that even if productivity does go up faster, uh, it won't make any difference if uh, it's decoupled from wages? And I would give you two examples. Amazon, Jeff Bezos is the richest person in the world, and his, the people in his distribution centers, the distribution centers are all subcontracted out. They pay minimum wage plus a little tiny bit, and they pull down the wages everywhere else. The other example I would give you is Walmart. The Walton Zone, something like the same amount as 40% of the people in the country, and they also pay very low wages. That's what is their, that's their technological innovation, and that's what it's used for. Thank you. Oh, sure. I'll, yeah, I'll take, I'll take that one, and... Um, and uh, briefly, um, but I think it's also kind of connected, I think, to Kevin's question as well. Um, 
So uh, it's interesting that you would ask this uh, question. We've done a lot of work thinking about how is it that you measure growth? How is it that we should be? What's the metric of success in an economy? And um, uh, have been talking a lot about uh, how it is that we can connect the income distribution data to the aggregate GDP data so that – so tomorrow GDP numbers are going to come out. And if we have our way at some point in the not-too-distant future, we won't just see what that aggregate GDP is, which, of course, is not trickling down, but what that looks like across the income distribution. So if growth tomorrow is 2.5 percent, what share of that 2.5 percent went to whom across the economy? That, I think, would be a really important first step so that your comment, um, Dr. Poplin, is actually at the forefront of policymakers' mind and, and news commentators' minds rather than an after thought. So I would argue that part of the way we got here is by thinking we could focus on growth or productivity and everything else will just magically take care of itself, because in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, it did. And I think that what we, I mean, my 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 increasingly, and this is an untested view, I haven't written about this yet, or really, so this is like, a, you know, not even hot off the press, but increasingly my conclusion is that many of the institutions that supported that strong, stable growth in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, like unions, uh, uh, like, you know, I mean, I think there are a lot of other institutions, but sort of a long list, community institutions. I'm thinking about the first Glenn's comment about uh, other explanations for rising inequality and norms, that those actually made the market work. Right? And so we let go of that in, in large part because economists kind of, we didn't think that, you know, we were like, oh, well, if the market is perfect. We can, those things are the, those are the distortions when in fact you needed those to actually have a market that worked as the textbook thinks it does because without those, you have this highly concentrated capital that is creating distortions that vastly outweigh almost anything else you can, um, you can look at. So that would be, but uh, one other thing on the manufacturing versus services, um, you know, I think we uh, – it's interesting because you're never going to get the same kind of productivity increases in the in the services that we think require humans unless you decide that those are no longer caring professions in some way, right? I mean, you could decide – and there was a, there's a sci-fi movie that I saw once about this where, you know, you had robots providing child care and elder care, um, you know, remotely, uh, you know, from a, a center in Mexico. You know, it was like this – but unless we want to do that, it's very difficult to imagine that you're ever going to get – you're never going to get the kind of productivity gains in those sectors because fundamentally the cost is what you're paying the worker, which is the antithesis of what we're struggling with up here when you're thinking, what are we going to pay people to do when machines can do so much? So if, if, to me, it seems like we have to flip that question on its head, which is how are we going to give people jobs that have meaning and value and, and, and pay them if the robots can do everything, which seems like a great problem to have if we could just reframe the question. Can, can I just... Get a 20-second intervention. So um, I think it would be a mistake to, th to say that, um, you know, productivity growth uh, doesn't matter because, you know, it doesn't matter for workers because, um, in a way, just have decoupled from productivity. So anything that happens to productivity is irrelevant to wages. I think, first of all, you know, there's evidence for the United States that um, – you know, any productivity shock is still transmitted to wages. I mean, there's work by Larry Summers and Anna Stansbury that shows that... In our book. Know, yeah, in the yeah. book, that, that actually shows that precisely that. Now, I think, so productivity growth is good for workers, it, you know, but the, the real question is, could it be better for workers? And I think there's a lot of things you could do um, that uh, these... Um, productivity gains get better shared. I mean, so one is, as um, uh, Jeremy said, that, uh, you know, there are questions of how do you strengthen the bargaining power of works. And in the U.S., I think, you know, you can, you can discuss um, collective bargaining. You can discuss non-compete clauses. There's a lot of things you could do that um, these productivity gains uh, are better shared. So take one or two more questions. Uh, if uh, there is interest, uh, quickly. Uh, yes, please. Okay. 
My name is Mariam Zia and I'm a student of Applied Economics at UMD. My question might be somewhat basic or stupid, uh, maybe because uh, the way um, uh, you know economics is far, uh, means advanced than what I know about economics. So in our micro class, we studied that if you decompose monopolies, then it might increase competition in market. So can there be a way that government can decompose monopolies uh, by some policies? Or can there be a stronger role of government in regulating the market, which can increase productivity or which can uh, translate into better gains for society? Thank you. Does this work? Yeah. No. No. Um, so, so it's not a stupid question at all. So the answer is yes. Uh, it has happened several times in history, right? So famously, Standard Oil was broken up in the U.S. because it was a monopoly of oil companies. Uh, AT&T was broken up. In Germany, there was a consortium or monopoly in the chemical industry uh, that was created in the 1920s. It was broken up in the 1940s. So we have uh, historical examples. The question is whether this is a sort of good policy tool for dealing with concentration. Now, I would say most economists would probably th think that the, unlike Standard Oil, uh, unlike AT&T or IG Farben, which was the German uh, conglomerate, the current monopolies in advanced countries have not were not created in an environment in which there was essentially no competition law or the state actually encouraged um, the formation of these cartels. And, and so the case is weaker, right? So these are companies that have grown by themselves for the most part. Uh, and, you know, for the most part, we've had pretty good uh, enforcement in pre preventing mergers for these mega companies. That said, uh, my former boss, uh, Sigmar Gabriel, who was the Minister for Economic Affairs, famously called in a, for a, in, a, in an article in, in 2015 for a breakup of Google. He didn't get very far with that, right? Um, and I, I'm not sure quite sure I agree with him, but you know, it's not a completely crazy idea. But I think the the real battleground right now is how to, how tough should we, we be on mergers, right? And that's where where people basically uh, disagree. Uh, I'm just going to add to that very briefly um, because I do think that there is uh, there is more to be done here in the U.S. I think I, I take a, a more uh, interventionist view um, uh, of the current situation. You know, many of the new platform firms look kind of like a utility at this point. Um, it doesn't make sense to have you know a hundred different Facebooks. Um, you know, should we should we think of those as utilities, especially given the important role that they're playing in terms of privacy and data? But um, you do see uh, so much of the anti-competitive behavior that these firms have engaged in. Amazon, Google, all of them, uh, Facebook, the way that they have um, stifled uh, competition in the marketplace really does, I think, warrant a deep dive and a look into whether or not um, it makes sense to allow this to, to continue. So, um, and I think that, so I take a little bit of it, we've done it before, um, but we haven't been enforcing the law in the same way over the past um, few decades in the United States since the 1980s. And I think we have to take that into account in terms of what we've allowed to happen. I see our panelists are warming up for more debate, uh, but unfortunately we've uh, run out of time. Uh, so I would like to thank you for coming and for your participation, and I would like to thank the uh, panelists. I mean, these are complex issues. Uh, on many of them there is continuing research, but uh, I would like to thank the panelists for sharing their insights, uh, their thoughts, uh, their findings. Uh, so we appreciate that. Let's give them a big hand.